What's going on, everybody? Thank you for joining us again this week for the Reseller Greatness podcast. We have a familiar face on the podcast, our first returning guest on the podcast. And I want to try to get it into a rotation where the guests return, maybe bring Carrie back, maybe bring Hanley back, maybe bring Michelle back because the people really like listening to you. I don't know if people want to listen to me for an hour every single week. It's a lot. It's overwhelming. So we got to mix it up and we got to spread it out between the people and I think that bringing you guys on makes the podcast better because there's feedback back and forth. And for you especially, I especially like talking to you because you always ask very challenging questions that make me think. And right before this, we don't pregame a lot before the podcast because I don't want to leave all the good conversation in the hallway. We got to we gotta keep it in the podcast room. But you said you have a bunch of questions, a bunch of prompts, and a bunch of things you want to work out together. So, you know, the last time we did speak, you were doing a shoe model that had high sell through with a smaller margin and you were kind of on this treadmill going and that resonated with a lot of people. So that was about two or three months ago. I, I, I don't want to get into all of it right now, but how is it going? Quick sentence. Give us a quick introduction of who you are, where you're from, what you do. Um, I'll post your channel down below. You got a channel. You started sharing some thoughts. It's going great. I enjoy listening to it. So I'll post it below. If you want to listen to a smart guy trying to get all this figured out, young guy with a family, that's the place to go. I enjoy listening to it. So just give us a little introduction and then I guess a little tiny update on the high sell through, low margin hamster wheel that you were on. What's changed? What's new? What's going on with my main man, Isaiah? I appreciate the introduction a ton, man. Like, But if you guys don't know who I am, my name's Isaiah. I am a six-figure shoe seller. And um, I almost did my intro for the video. It's just it. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah, so like I started a YouTube channel shortly after we did the uh, podcast with Tech. And, you know, so that's over there. He's going to drop everything on there. But that's not what we're talking about today. When it comes to the old model, um, I was doing free shipping where I was focused on moving as many pairs as possible. And I think that that model had a bunch of issues and it, I wasn't disciplined enough when it came to offers. So I would... Let's say I had something priced at 25 and someone sent me a $15 offer. That's the same as selling it for $5 plus shipping, right? That's and right. like, you don't make any money at $5 plus That's shipping. Right. So um, I needed to be substantially more disciplined. But instead of doing that, I just turned shipping back on. And when I last came to see you guys, my sales were in the toilet. Like they were, I hadn't sold much over that past week. And, you know, things slowly started to turn back on. And the extra shipping was, was really useful. My ASP went up some. But... Right after that happened, dude, I lost my primary supplier. So like mm -hmm. the the whole thing that the model fringed upon or whatever, or like relied on, fell apart. So I had to go out into the regular thrifts and pay nine dollars per pair again, and uh, like see if I can make that business model work. And from that, I learned so many different things, primarily about how do you sell shoes at thirty dollars, thirty five dollars, forty dollars, fifty dollars. And the things that I learned about that was. Those shoes specifically tend to have substantially fewer flaws. So it wasn't that I was picking up the wrong items. It was that the items that I was picking up, the condition standards were not high enough. So as I was going back into the thrifts, paying these eight, nine dollars per pair, I went, OK, let's make sure they don't have interior tears. Let's make sure the tread is good. Let's make sure the uppers are not too dirty so that they're not covered in stains and stuff like that. Even though I had the ability to sell those pairs, it wasn't worth it for me because those pairs would only sell for 15, 20 dollars or so. Once I increased the condition standards, I started seeing those $30 sales, $35 sales. And I had this big revelation that I didn't know before, which is there are times where you could sell an item for like, just because you price an item that can sell for $35 at $25, it doesn't necessarily mean it will sell faster. Like you could potentially put it at 35 and sell it just as fast as you would have sold it at 25. But I didn't know that I was missing out on all that money by not actually pricing my items appropriately. So I switched my pricing structure and it's made it so that I've been able to get more of a, a higher return whenever I'm actually selling a pair, which is pretty good. So just on that one minute, we could probably do a two hour podcast just based on those <laughs> topics alone. I already have a half sheet of notes just based on that. So, um, all right. So you, you started charging shipping, which has helped. Tell us a little bit about, because you are probably way more familiar with the, with the cubic and ground shipping now, ground advantage. That has been a godsend to shoe sellers. So I don't sell a lot of these particular items where it has impacted my business as much. Take us through the difference between first class and priority 
which was about six to eight months ago, where now ground advantage goes all the way up to 70 pounds. And yeah. now you can even do cubic. What is the difference to shoe sellers? What kind of Hail Mary have shoe sellers been thrown? I think the I think uh, the post office killed priority mail for us shoe sellers. Like it, it just there's so few scenarios where at least when it comes to cost effectiveness, where it makes more sense to do uh, priority mail. And my items are getting there just as quickly, usually within two, three, four days. So all of my feedback still says fast shipping, doing exclusively ground advantage. The upsides is my average shipping back in the day used to be like nine eighty nine, right? Sure. So I was it was around nine eighty nine per pair to ship it out. Now it's like. It's crazy to say this, but it's like six twelve or something. Wow! Like yeah, it's it's in now. It's gonna range, you know, depending on like the weight of your items, where they're going, cool. and stuff like that. But most of my items are gonna be shipping between like six to seven dollars, and, and maybe if it goes to Oregon or like higher in California, maybe that'll be around eight bucks at the highest using Ground Advantage. So you, if you're charging nine ninety nine shipping, ten ninety nine shipping, like many shoe sellers are, there's a lot of people who do men's shoes for twelve ninety nine per pair. If yeah. you can ship men's shoes for seven dollars now so they're making six dollars profit just on shipping and then you have however much however much profit you might be paying for the shoe on the shipping sure. alone sure. doing 12.99 and it, it's it's completely changed the game now but um for shoes that are between the two to three pound limit it's it's really beautiful before that i wasn't really doing much first class i most of my shoes were between two to three pounds Absolutely. um but even when it comes to the shoes that are one pound like some of your lighter weight hokas or on clouds your sandals of course those mm -hmm. are going to be shipping for like five to six dollars as well so it's it's insane how much so cost things we're getting now at scale if you sell 100 shoes a week which is not out of the ordinary you're picking up an extra two or three hundred bucks a week profit easy, just easy. on the decrease in shipping which when is i switched to the bucks a month when I switched to the poly mailers, I think I was averaging when, on my weekend things when I would switch them to the lighter weights and stuff and then adding the ground advantage and cubing into it as well. Like my total would say six hundred, seven hundred dollars for my shipping or whatever. And then it dropped to like four twenty. Like, so can we it, talk about that real quick? So once upon a time, I flew my guy out, Isaiah, down here to meet the number one shoe seller on eBay and probably the number one pre-owned shoe seller in the entire world. We went to the warehouse. It's right down the street. Isaiah set his eyes like like Lion King, the opening act where the sun comes up. We set our eyes on a million pairs of shoes inside that warehouse. And a couple of things I, I wanted him to see was that just the opportunity is endless. And, you know, and I also want to get into that a little bit as well, where you were picking up the cheaper shoes with the flaws. So you were like relegating yourself to the bottom tier. So I want to get into that a little bit, too. So the the trip. I wanted Isaiah to expand his horizons. He's a young guy um, from Mississippi. I wanted to expand the horizon and kind of show him what they're doing at the very top, where he can implement that into his business. And one of the biggest takeaways was you were dead set um, sending out your shoes in boxes. You know, it, it's better for the customer. It, it's better for the protection, this and that. And when we went down to um, the number one shoe seller, they were shipping in poly bags. And his feedback was just as good as yours, fast shipping, item arrived great, this and that. So what was kind of like that last hurdle? Because we were trying to convince you for, for years on the shoe calls to switch to poly bags. Nope, don't want to talk about it. I get it. I get it. You run your business how you see fit. Um, and, and if that's what you feel is best for your business, I get it. Nothing wrong with doing that. What was kind of the last straw with moving over to poly bags and you've been doing that um i think you came down last april so almost a year ago what has been the positive what has been the negatives to switching to poly bags and what what was the last straw it's gonna suck to say but there hasn't been a negative so we can okay. skip the negative part <laughs> no, okay. but here's the thing here's the thing i do believe i probably still believe that shipping your items in a box would be I a agree. superior presentation I than agree. shipping them in a poly bag um, mm -hmm. the customer is likely going to feel like, oh man, my item is cared for, you know, but the, the customer just doesn't really care that much. And you said it was you and him that kind of like shook me up with this. Number one was a thing that you said when I was at your warehouse, which was, I have a stack of poly mailers right here, actually. Like this right here is the same thing as a stack of boxes. It's the same sure. thing, but those boxes, go ahead. Yeah. A stack of made boxes will be to the roof. Mm -hmm. In that equivalent, that's 50 bags. A stack of boxes is to the roof. 
Exactly. So like this right here, like you might, you guys might not understand what I mean, but these are ready to go. I can take these, throw a shoe in them and they're rocking and rolling. If these were boxes that have not been built yet, like I have to build the box first. And then after building the box, I put the shoe in there, close the box. And now it's taking up what? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten 10 times as much space as I would be otherwise. And to build all those boxes, that's a half day. Mm -hmm. Like that's a half day. Like, Getting on it, that's hours. A couple distractions here or there, that's a half day building boxes. And number two, my my post office carrier, because he'd have to carry the stacks and stacks of boxes to the truck, right? Yeah. So he, when I switched the bags and he was just saying, he said, I'm able to Santa Claus your stuff away now. Like, I love this. You know, he just, he grabs the bags that they come in and I, he just rocks and roll out and it's way easier for him. Um, so it's better for my, for my carriers who are part of our team. You know what I mean? Yeah, and number absolutely. two, it's faster for us. And otherwise I would have to have, like you said, I'd have to have a full-time person on staff constantly making boxes and that, you know, what's crazy at Pizza Hut. We always had um, a person on staff who was constantly making boxes. Like we would before Super Bowl, we'd fill a room up with boxes, wow. and like someone's job for the day was just making pizza hut boxes, making pizza hut boxes because of how inconvenient it could be. Sure. Um, but like with these, like they, it's the same effectiveness of a box. If you have, you don't want to get like weak poly mailers though. Do you want to make sure they're at least tear proof? Because there are levels to poly mailers as well. Like some of them just suck, and if you're using poly mailers that suck, it might be worse than spending the time to make a box but um if you get good quality poly mailers which aren't that expensive like what 12 cents 19 cents sure. something like that sure. um you can pretty easily uh well at least for this size mine are like 14 by 19 if you have a smaller poly mailer, it's just different but um dang it what was i saying oh yeah but yeah like it, it's, it's way more it's way more effective for me to have these poly mailers and then the other thing was sales what 300 shoes per day so they're selling 10 times, 15 times as many shoes as I am. He's telling me, hey, dude, number one, you shouldn't be thinking about this. Because I spent, after we did the tour, I, after he showed me the bags, I'm like, nah, man. I'm just thinking about the bags the whole time. He's showing me other stuff. I'm like, man, there's no way I can ship in bags. I got to beat this guy not shipping in bags. There's no way. I can't. I have to do it in boxes. And then at one point, he looks at me and goes, like, hey, like, what's going on? I'm like, bro. I just can't do this, this, this shipping in, in bags thing, bro. I got to ship in my box. And he's like, wait, you're still thinking about that? Yeah. He's like, dude, li like, listen to me, bro. Listen to me. Yeah. Like, just, you're, you're wasting all your time thinking about whether or not you should do this. This should have already been a decision that was made and you move on to the next thing. Instead of absorbing this environment around us right now, instead you're thinking about, should you ship it in bags or boxes? Dude, my feedback's the same as your feedback. That's the same. It's my the same. customers say pockets are fatter than yours because they're exactly. saving on shipping. <laughs> so and his customers, his customers are saying great packaging. We love the item, this, that, yeah. and the other. So it's like if it was that bad of an issue, how come he can ship three hundred items a day and his customers aren't revolting? And I'm like, oh man, if I ship my fifteen per day like that, they're gonna they're gonna hate it. So that those were the two things that kind of broke for me. One, you saying like this is a box, like this is yep. a box already made, and you just yep. gotta throw a shoe in it. And two, him being like, dude, stop thinking about this stuff. This is completely unimportant. You just just put them in the bags. You'll be fine. See what happens. And when I did it, it wasn't even an issue at all. Customers Absolutely. loved it, and I've had more customers say, hey could you please ship my item in a bag so they can put it in my mailbox? Then people say, can you ship it in a box? Way more. It's not even close. Like I've had one customer ask for a box in like seven or eight over this period of time that asked for it in a bag specifically. So. Wow. All right. So just real quick, in addition to that, are there cases where items do go in a box? Sure. Maybe a pair of cowboy boots, maybe something like that. So we're not painting with a broad brush. But for the most part, most shoes can ship in a poly bag. No problem. They'll arrive to the customer on time. So you touched on a couple of things here. Um, the opportunity cost and then the return of investment of our time. So instead of spending a half day making boxes, now we can spend a half day doing things that are going to be productive for our business, profitable for our business, move the needle. And if we're spending a half day you know, five days a week, that's two and a half days that we're just sitting here making boxes where we could be sourcing better items. We could be making better listings. We could be selling more items. And how much money are we losing by doing these tasks that aren't going to affect the profitability or affect our sales or affect the bottom line? Um, 
so opportunity costs I want to talk about today and then the return on time I want to talk about today. So um, I want to touch on real quick why you were choosing these shoes that were not good quality. Was it because they were cheap? Why, why did you feel like you had to go down that avenue as opposed to going down the avenue where you're selling shoes for $30, $40, 50 I believe... I didn't believe that people who sold shoes for $30, $40, $50 had the same sell-through rate as I did um, selling shoes for 20 to 25 bucks. Um, I, I just did. And whenever I would look at people's stores who had a $30, $40, $50, $60 dollar ASP, across the board, they typically had a you know six-month sell-through on average for 100% of their items, maybe a little bit slower than that. So it was it was very rare to see circumstances where people didn't have, even sometimes with people who, were, who had like excellent shoes, you know, um, they... So I didn't believe that excellent shoes equated to fast sell-through rate. I know that you could get more profit, but I was believing that if I had a faster sell-through rate than all of them, I'd be able to turn the money over so many times that at the end, my snowball is bigger than theirs, even though they're getting more profit per item. I don't currently believe that anymore, um, but I did believe that for a long time. And I think that's why I focus in on those shoes. And I knew that I had the unique ability of being able to sell shoes between the 15 to 30 dollar range and it's i used to also think that everybody could do that but it's not really the case a lot of people have tried that business model and they struggle a lot with pulling it off either because they can't get the shoes low enough or they can't move the shoes as effectively as i was able to so since i had so much success moving these lower quality shoes um i was like maybe i could build an entire business model behind this well, you had success moving them, but the bank account wasn't moving. So mm -hmm. even even though, you know, so where, where did these beliefs come from? Was it just looking at other stores and seeing how they were performing? Like, why did you settle on this? And, and like, where did the beliefs come from? How did you get how did you fall into that? I have like a whole tab in, on my computer of like <laughs> stores that I, I'm not going to say the name of the tab because I sometimes I screen share, but there's a tab that has a bunch of people's stores on it. And I would look at all of their stores in this tab and they would follow this trend of, you know, 30, 40, $50 ASP. But let's say they have a thousand items in their store over the last 90 days, they've sold like 300 or so. Okay. And it's, it's very, when I see that, it makes me like, I don't know. Like I, I just, I mean, you, we were talking about this um when we were at we we're like, hey, you, you were saying, yeah, sure, the sell through rate is lower, but they're making money. Like they're making five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollars a day. Just do that. And I'm like, yeah. I get that, but I don't want six thousand, seven thousand, ten thousand items in the store in order to do that. Again, I've changed these beliefs a little bit from this from mm -hmm. that point. But at that time, I was like, yeah, I think because I was selling the same quantity of pairs as they were selling with a much smaller store, which made me believe that if I could increase my mm -hmm. um if i could just increase my store size when i get to their level i'll be making substantially more money than them so for example if i'm listing 2000 selling 2000 then once i get to 6000 if everything stays the same i should be listing 6000 selling 6000 however i never got to the 6000 so i didn't get to see the benefits of that <laughs> but also if you're listing 6000 selling 6000 in your model the infrastructure that you would have to build out still makes it a non -pro a not profitable model Mm -hmm. because the margins are too low and in order to, to do 6,000, you're going to need a lot of help. You're going to need a big space and it's still not profitable. So you were, you were kind of, instead of building the biggest snowball, you were trying to like brute force it. And at that point, it's not going to work. Yeah. I just, I couldn't get my store large enough where it, where it makes sense. I needed to be listing like 40, 50 items a day, but mm -hmm. the, necessary thing to get 40 50 items a day is it's tough you know what i mean yeah. um and even if you can get the items processing it is hard and i recently had a baby too which made that even more difficult right. um so it the, it really fit my back broke when it came to the processing and if i had the ability to process more of those pairs it could have worked but why not just go like 10 into 40 you know what i mean yeah, why, not? why not just do that <laughs> why, why not just do you know, 15 or 20, $20 profit items a day and just live a happy reseller life. So, you know, that that's kind of like, you know, we, we have to weigh this a lot. It, it's it's the opportunity cost. So we all have opportunities. We have different opportunities and not all of them are going to give us the best bang for the buck. So when you see a new opportunity and you might be the king of new opportunities, you got a lot of opportunities rolling around, a little squirrel brain action every now and then. How do you 
assess the opportunity and decide if this is an opportunity that I should make for my business? What is your assessment or what is the definition of, of opportunity cost for the folks that, you know, let, let's just level the playing field and get everyone on the same page? Yeah, so I looked this up and um, <laughs> this this is the first of my questions that I have on the list. I have a list right here to my side and we'll, I'll go through it as we're talking. But uh, opportunity cost is the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. So in other words, like you losing potential money, potential this, potential whatever, um, because you chose one alternative and there were other alternatives that could have been better for you, basically. Mm -hmm. And like my issue with that is I think potential causes issues. And I literally just went through this when it came to like deciding to whether I should sell clothing or not. I think it's so easy to get in your head about what you could have done. Like, hey, if I do this, maybe I would be able to get this as well. Because I thought I could totally do six figures a year selling clothing. And that could potentially be, I do $15,000 in shoes, $15,000 in clothing. In total, we're doing 30K a month and I am more valuable as a buyer to any of the people that I'm getting my supply from. Because not only can I do shoes, I can now also do clothing. Really good. It makes me strong. But that's potential. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not guaranteed. It's not that you can actually make that happen. So how do you, for you, how do you weigh opportunities? Because the way I think about it is I think you should set like a little a threshold basically you go you evaluate the opportunity based on that threshold mine right now is can it bring 100k right because i'm if i'm doing 100k in shoes if anything else that i pick up should also be able to do 100k um so i did feel clothing was that way but i didn't think of all of the difficulties that come along with it that makes it more difficult to get to that hundred thousand so how does it uh, work for you so for me i always weigh opportunity costs with what is going to fill my bank account with the most amount of money with the least resistance. Mm -hmm. That's how I measure it. And I define it. That right there, the least resistance part is so interesting. That's right. I didn't have that in my, you heard what I said. I said a hundred K, right? If yeah. I can do a hundred thousand dollars and that's in sales, by the way, if I can do a hundred thousand dollars in the thing, maybe it's worth it for me to do it. But I never considered with the least resistance. Can you talk about that for a second? What does it mean to be the least resistance when we're talking about like a category or deciding whether we should enter this niche or something of that sort. Sure. What's so, the least so starting something brand new is more resistance than keep doing what you're doing. That's working. So that's number one. Um, you have to look at the complexity of what you're dealing with. Is it easier or not as easy as what you're doing? You have to look at the build out, the storage, the photos, the learning curve. If all of that, is, is going to be easier or not as easy as just doubling down on what you're currently doing. You have to look at how difficult it is to get the items. You have to look at, you have to look at the entire picture. So the reason why I chose clothing was that I went to the flea market and every single vendor had a pile of clothes that was waist high. You guys see it in the videos. Every single vendor has clothing. That's a pretty low bar, low barrier of entry. You walk to the flea market, you find clothes. I knew with a little bit of knowledge that I can find the clothes that they don't know enough about. Whether it's brand, whether it's style, whether it's nuance, price, sell through, all of that stuff. So I knew that the barrier to entry for clothing for me personally was lower than it was if I was trying to get all the video games. And if I had my choice, I would sell video games because they sell the fastest. And you know that's really getting your money turning right there because they got the market price. If you're one penny under market, it's going to sell immediately. Unfortunately, at my flea markets, I've never shown a video game on there. They're, they're very hard to come by. They do have some out there, but they're not good games. I know the good games. They're not good games. So the barrier to entry to, to finding video games locally is very difficult. I have never seen a video game at my thrift store. Not one time. They, my district must bring them in and they must sell them online. I have never seen a video game one time at any thrift store I've ever been to, never. So we had Jack on um, two weeks ago and Jack sells exclusively video games. However, Jack sources online, he buys collections, he breaks them down, he tests them, he has something that he does with the duds and he keeps the best ones, he sends those into Amazon. So he has to order online, break down the buy a collection, break down the collection, test the collection, refinish the discs, 
find a way to monetize the duds, send them into Amazon, sell them on Amazon. For me, I can go to a thrift store with the knowledge of clothing. I can get it, bring it home. I already have the process set up. Why don't I just do more clothing than jumping into something else? So for me, the least resistance is I found something that has worked, finding clothing for cheap. And all of my videos, I rarely spend over $5. The last video I put out last week, I bought one item for $10. It was a $150 jacket. Every other item in there was less than five bucks. So that is a low barrier to entry. My cost of goods is very low. So I want to make the most money with the least amount of money because especially when I started out, I didn't have a bunch of money to be throwing around. So what is going to fill up my bank account? The easiest, the fastest, the quickest with the least barrier to entry or the least resistance. It would, it would be foolish of me to do anything else at this point other than find a lot of clothes, process a lot of clothes and sell a lot of clothes. So part of me, you know, my eBay career, 15 years, every single day of my life, I listed on eBay, never missed a day, every single day listed on eBay, um, listed 120 items every single day for almost 10 years by myself, no help every single day. And then I got employees around the shutdown. And every single day, we listed 250 items a day. We never sold 500 items a day. We never sold 600 items a day. We sold between 250 and 300 items every single day. When I figured out that I have the most valuable part of my business, what is the most valuable part of my business? The fact that you can get the inventory so easily. That I can get the inventory. So once I scaled the business past going to thrift stores, past going to the flea market, now I have the inventory that comes into me. Everything is washed, prep, zip, buttons, everything. The opportunity cost to make the most money with the least amount of resistance was now no longer selling items on eBay because I'm only going to sell 250 and to 300 items every single day. But now since the inventory comes into me and I've set up this, this scale where I have people that bring inventory every single day, now I can ship pallets and I can sell a thousand pieces at a time. So now I'm selling 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 pieces a day. Sometimes I send out four pallets a day. No photos, no listing, no big warehouses holding stuff. I, I don't need all the employees coming around listing items. So now what fills up my bank account the most with the least resistance is now a wholesale model. My, my business has evolved into... Buying one item, selling one item on eBay. I did a Craigslist arbitrage. Buy on, e buy on Craigslist, sell on eBay. That was my best opportunity at the time. It evolved to going into thrift stores. That was my best opportunity at the time. It evolved going to flea markets. That was my best opportunity at the time. It, it evolved into going to thrift stores, going to flea markets, and then having people bring inventory to me. That was my best opportunity at the time. And then my best opportunity at the time, once I figured out people bringing inventory to me, my best opportunity for return on time and my return on opportunity was sitting my butt in the chair, having people bring me inventory and me listing 250 items a day. That was the best return on time because I make no money when I'm driving around to thrifts. I make no money at the thrift store. I make no money when I'm at the flea markets. I make no money doing anything other than listing items on eBay, getting them sold and getting them shipped out. That's where we make money. I don't make money driving around. And at one point in time, my, th my thrift store route was 55 thrift stores a week. And I went to the flea market three times a week. And on Saturday and Sunday, I went to two flea markets those weeks. My thrifting route was 80 hours a week alone. I made no money during this time. So I needed to find a way for the best return on my time was sitting my butt in the chair, creating quality listings, having inventory brought into me. I, I did that for many years and we sold 250, 300 items a day, millions of dollars, $2.5 million a year. Then the best opportunity for me and for my time was to just sell the stuff wholesale. Because instead of selling 250 items a day and getting most of the money, now I can sell 1,000 items a day, 2,000 items a day, 4,000 items a day and get a little piece of the money. And I make way more money selling 1,000 items a day and getting a little piece 
than I do selling 250 items a day and doing all of the work involved with it, where that is now the best return on my time and the best opportunity cost that I have. And you can scale that out because on eBay, I have the pressure of getting everything shipped. I'm underneath that thumb. If someone doesn't show up, I'm there. So the opportunity is, is not always monetarily because some people, they have the opportunity cost of doing eBay and then taking their kids to school every single day. That is an opportunity for them that is valuable. They, they have the opportunity of doing eBay and then going to all of their kids' baseball games or soccer games and not having to ask a boss at Pizza Hut, hey, can I get Wednesday night off? My kid has a game. That is an opportunity cost. So they have forego the job for the opportunity cost of going out and seeing their kids' games or bringing their kids to school or picking up their kids from school. It's not always monetarily for the opportunity cost. However, this is a business podcast, so we, we, we look at the monetary side of it. So for me... When you combine that I can make more money wholesaling pallets, 2,000 items a day, more money, net, net profit, more profit, and I don't have to list all the items. I don't have to do everything involved with it. And now the opportunity cost where I'm not under the thumb of shipping. And if I don't want to ship a pallet today, I can ship it tomorrow. There's no penalty. I communicate with, with, with the buyer and say, hey, um, you know, Today is not a good day. I'll ship it out tomorrow. No problem. Do I do that? No. But do I have the option to do that? Absolutely. So on both of those fronts where net net, I can sell a thousand pieces today and make more money than selling 250 pieces without all the resistance. And we know what the resistance is of eBay and listing one at a time. All of that is eliminated. So I'm filling up my bank account with more money with no resistance and the time, the freedom of doing it, if I want to ship all my pallets out in one day and stock up for the week, I can do that and I can leave for six days. So we have to measure what is going to fill my bank account up with the most amount of money the quickest with the least resistance. And that's why my business has evolved in the way that it has, because instead of me being the most valuable commodity in my business, where I was not listing, so I was not being valuable to my business. If I am listing, I was the most valuable commodity in my business. No longer is me listing the most valuable commodity in my business. Now the most valuable commodity in my business is what? The access to all of the good eBayable inventory that I was at one point turning away because I only needed 250 pieces a day. So there was a long time where I was telling my my suppliers, okay, you can bring me a thousand pieces, you can bring me five hundred, you can bring me eight hundred, you can bring me four hundred, because I have a buying quota of two hundred and fifty items a day. I was turning away pieces because I didn't have the infrastructure to facilitate and process more than two hundred and fifty items a day. So I figured out that no longer was I the most valuable commodity in my business with my fingers on the keyboard listing items. The most valuable commodity in my business was access and the infrastructure, the sourcing infrastructure that I have set up where, hey, no, you don't have to bring me 400 anymore. Open up the spigot. You can bring me a thousand a week. You can bring me a thousand a week. You can bring me a thousand a week. And now instead of only selling 250 a day, now I'm going to sell 3000 pieces a day. And I'm going to make more money, fill up my bank account with more money without the complications or the resistance of everything that eBay has to offer. Now, can you go first day and get to that level? No, there's levels to it. Because like I said, at one once upon a time, my best opportunity and my best return on time was buying one T-Mobile Sidekick and selling one T-Mobile Sidekick. That was my best opportunity. Thrift store became my best opportunity. Flea market became my best opportunity. Relationships at flea markets became my best opportunity. And then the infrastructure of relationships that I've built out, the army of suppliers that I've built out where we touch just about every piece of clothing that comes through here. Now that is my best opportunity. And that is my best, most valuable commodity is those relationships. And if you watch the videos, I'm building out on that as someone who doesn't go to these flea markets, and I'm going to flea markets I don't go to intentionally, because I can go to my flea market. I've been there for 15 years. I can go there. I'm the president there. I shake hands. Everybody knows me there. 
I choose to go to flea markets. I don't go to, to show you guys how to do this from the start. I went to a flea market brand new, didn't know anybody did good deals. I went back there the next week. People are holding stuff for me. Um, one guy had a hundred pieces held for me. The other guy had 80 pieces held for me. Just those two vendors was two or three thousand dollars in profit. Second week going. Imagine me going to my flea market for 15 years. Imagine me with these relationships that I have with my suppliers for the last five or six years. We're, we're, we're rock steady. We're strong. We're on the same page. We're bringing in great inventory. And that is the most valuable part of my business is all of these relationships. And that is why a large part transitioned from selling 250 items a day. Because this is where people think. People think I gave up that money. Oh, he gave up eBay money. Listen, look me in the face. I am not a fool. I don't go backwards. I don't minus myself. If I make a change or if I do something different, there's going to be a better payoff. A better payoff with least resistance. So yeah, eBay, 250 items a day, that's going to end. The warehouse is up in August, that's ending. Net, net, I am making way more money by selling more pieces and getting a smaller piece of every single piece because no longer am I the most valuable commodity in the business. The most valuable commodity has now been the infrastructure that's been built out for wholesale. And, and you've been in the group for a while. I've been talking about this for five years in the group. I've told you guys five years ago what I'm going to do. I said, on this day, eBay is going to stop. I'm going to change to this. This is what we're going to do. And it has played out perfectly. Five, eight years ago on the very first podcast, I talked about taking a 50-year vacation. It's going to happen. All of this has been planned out every single step along the way. And these are the things that we have to think about. Every single decision that we make, every single decision that we make, is this going to fill up my bank account with least resistance than what I'm facing right now? So I, I don't talk about my business a lot on this. I don't. I, I, I don't come on here and, and pontificate what my business is, how great it is, how, how bad it is. I, I don't do that. I like to talk to you guys, but this is probably the first time that I've given any sort of insight into the thinking behind the decisions that I make for the business. And on surface level, it looks like, oh, well, you're giving up $2.5 million on eBay. Yeah, but Isaiah and I will be talking during lunch sometimes when I have a minute and Isaiah's like, what are you doing now? And I'll send Isaiah a screenshot of $25,000, one deal. So like, believe me, I'm not giving up 250 items a day. Don't worry about that part. Net, net, I have found a better way to fill up my bank account with more money with least resistance. So let me, let me, let me hop in here. There's a dude, dude. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> all right. So let's cook. Let's cook. All right. So um, let, let's, 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 let's explain this least resistance part for like illustrated to people real quick. So I got a question for you. You said you're doing like a thousand to 2000 items a day now doing the wholesale. Yeah. So if you wanted to do, let's say 1500 to, to, to be in the middle, if you wanted to do 1500 items a day on eBay, what would be required? All right. So for 250 items, what was required was three people um, listing and taking photographs and two shippers. So there was five people. That was 250. So, I mean, let, let's just expand that out by by six. And I would need 30 people. Yeah. I, I would need 30 people and probably... Um, I have 10,000 square feet, so probably 50 or 60,000 square feet to do that. Okay. And how achievable is it to get to, you got to manage 30 people too, by the way, Tick. Yeah, you got to so, manage. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. So I would need 30 people. And at that point, you need HR. At that point, you probably need a lawyer on staff. At that point, you, you probably need a couple, um, you probably need a handyman to come around and fix everything. You probably need a couple cleaners on staff. So I probably really, really need between 40 and 45 people mm -hmm. to do so, 1500 items a day. So you have, you have, and then a bunch more space where like, we, I saw the space there. Like it's yeah. not easy to go scoop up an extra, you know, 40,000, 50,000 square feet. So not you might even South Florida. Yeah. Not they, it, it's, it's difficult to come by space that large. So what I would also have to do realistically, if I wanted to do this, 
I would probably have to move the headquarters from where it is five minutes from my house. I would probably have to move it to North Florida and buy um, a much larger warehouse with much larger land where it is a little bit cheaper. And by doing that, I'd have to hire a whole new staff. So start from zero. So the three superstars that I had that could list 360 items every single day because we did five days. We did seven days of work in five days. We listed 360, but I made 250 live. The rest, the rest went into drafts for Saturday and Sunday when they didn't work. So my three superstars, I would have to convince to move up there. Probably not happening. And then also, I'd have to come down here to get all the inventory because this is where all my sourcing is. Or I'd have to pay them to drive up in U-Haul trucks and drop it off. So like, could it have happened? Sure. Was there complexity? Sure. Was there more resistance than putting a bag into a, a Gaylord box and calling someone to pick it up? Yes. So with, let's say you have 40 people, right? And then that's not even including, like, let's say as you're getting closer and closer to the 1500, you run into new problems that like sure. you didn't even plan for as you get there. So you 40 people, right? And a bunch more space compared to how many people does it take now for you to be able to do your, uh, your Gaylords that, that you're my, sending out? My son does it. <laughs> One, my, my, there you go. My, my son, he just turned 21. He, he sorts everything because we sort everything because I want to make sure everything gets perfect. E everything is perfect. There's no Vero's in there. There's no fake jerseys because the people who bring the stuff, I give them good guidance, but like I don't want to, you know, corner them or anything like that. So are there items that, that come in that are Vero's? Like let's say like a Ferrari shirt. It has value, but Ferrari gives Vero's. Let's say Grunt Style. Grunt Style has va value, but Grunt Style gives Vero's. I don't want to jam someone up with a Vero. So I look at every single piece. I inspect it, make sure it's good. And there are these brands that are under the radar that, that will pop you with a Vero. So none of that stuff comes through here. So I look at it. We assess it. He knows the Vero items. I'm down there sometimes sorting it from time to time as well. But it takes one person. One person and a couple DMs on Instagram and the deal's done. So we're looking at... For 40 people, let's say if they're full time, that's 1600 total hours per week compared to like 40, maybe. Not even, dude. Like it, it takes it takes two hours to sort a day's worth of stuff. So about a thousand items, it takes them an hour and a half, two hours, and then another hour to pack it up. So we're talking three hours a day. Three so hours looking... a day, low resistance. I, I get to toss the money to my son rather than toss the money to 40 different people who... You know, we're, we're, we're keeping it in the family. We're keeping it in the circle. So for me, that that's a net net win that I can toss the money to him. Um, I don't have to be here. I don't have to make sure the items get shipped on time because eBay is going to give me a bunch of defects. I don't have to make sure with 40 people, there's always someone leaving, someone having a baby, hiring, firing, quitting, going on vacation. You got that revolving door. I don't have to worry about people's cars breaking down or someone catching a flat or someone catching a dead battery. And the the least resistance, so far, this is the lowest bar of resistance that I have and found bro, to how the much, most amount of money. How much simpler is that, by the way? Like, so put, a, like put the stuff in the in this box, put a label on the box, go to that's the person it. when they come pick it up. Yeah. Like you, that's, you, it's you no eBay. It's you no eBay it UI. No, that's it. You put it in a box, you wrap it with plastic, and it's on its way. That's it. There's that's no it. eBay UI. There's no figuring out if this one's priority mail or if it's ground advantage. It's no, in this case, we put it here. In that case, you just put it in a box and you're done. Put it in a box. Now, I, I couldn't do this if I didn't have it built out. I mm -hmm. couldn't do this if I can only find 25 pieces a week. I couldn't mm -hmm. do this at that level. But now the best opportunity for me, and, and I've been very fortunate, and, you know, I'm in a different stage of my life um, where I've done this every single day of my life for 15 years. I've done the grind. I, I have grinded it out. I'm in a different stage of my life where now there's an opportunity that has been built out where this is the most, the closest to passive income as I'll ever be able to find involving clothing. So me stopping to list on eBay and just walking away would be foolish. I would be walking away from millions of dollars. But me stopping to list on eBay and then growing this portion of the business is a no-brainer. And just for everybody, 1,600 hours versus like 20. Like, sure. come on. 
and more money, like 20 hours, substantially more money. Like it's, it's, it's night and day. It's obvious. So here we, here we go. Here's the second thing you mentioned earlier that most, you make the most money with your butt in the chair, right? As someone who, who runs an eBay store. Yep. I think, I don't know if that's the case. I think we make the most money sourcing. And the reason why I say that is because I think even now, when you look at the amount of hours that are spent, I think your business has more hours spent sourcing, finding high quality inventory than it spent than it has processing inventory. Even if you were listing on eBay today, because think about it, you have you you have three guys, four guys, five guys that are out looking for inventory all day, every day, right? So they're putting in their forty hours a week looking for inventory, and then you on the weekend now, you're going out every single weekend going to to flea markets getting even more inventory who you're getting inventory from people who also spent all week trying to get that stuff too so i believe that w w there's this trend that i'm seeing with a couple of the sellers that are bigger than me where they spend a lot of time sourcing like they are always out there trying to get the best possible inventory they can so that they can go get the stuff processed i do agree that the only time we're generating profit is when we're actually listing our items of course but i feel like I took that mindset and went, okay, I should spend the least amount of time sourcing as possible, the least amount of time trying to get extra sources and get more inventory, and I should spend as much time as possible on the computer. But if you can find a way to raise your ASP, get better items that sell faster, that sell better, like your business goes, because there are scenarios where you, can, you could get inventory for a dollar. We've seen these business models. They're, they're everywhere. Where you're getting your inventory from like the bins or something for a dollar, two dollars, you're trying to sell it for 15 that business model is a thing, but it's really, really hard to bring that business model into reality without an awful sell through rate. So, but there's people out there who buy inventory for 10 bucks, 15 bucks, and they're selling it for 40, 50, $55. And if you look at the trends on those two business models, one is like skyrocketing rocketing off while the two into 15, even though the margins are good, it's not actually making that much money. And I think the reason for this, and I ran into this issue too, is when you mark down an item that's priced at $50, now that item's 35 bucks and you're still making good money. 15 into 35 isn't awful, right? Especially plus shipping. Now you compare that to you have the item at $15 and now you sell it for nine, $2 into $9 isn't that much money. And it's really, really difficult to build a business on $2 into $9. You're making what, three, four, five dollars in cash flow, maybe? So like you're making five bucks in cash flow, six bucks in cash flow, and you have to do that how many times a day for it to be worth it. And that's why those people tend to need 50, 60, 70, 80 um, item a day listing goals compared to someone who's going 15 into 50, where they can potentially put up what, you know, five items today and make a good living. You know what I mean? I got you. Respectfully, I'm going to tell you why you're dead wrong. Dude, let's do this. I'm ready. <laughs> so first and foremost, we're, we're, we're just going to make it apples to apples. We're not going to say that I have these people bringing inventory to me because that, that that's an advantage. Okay. So apples to apples, I'm going out finding my own stuff, right? Yes. And like you said, we spend all day, we should spend all of our time finding the stuff, right? That that should be the focus. Not all of our time, but that should be our focus because that's yes. where, where we are most valuable, right? Yes. On the video this week, I got over $5,000 worth of stuff, conservative, without even padding it with shipping. If you want to count shipping too, it's probably $8,000 worth of stuff, but I didn't even count that. I'm talking pure product. I got $5,000, $5,500 worth of stuff. I did that in three hours. Mm -hmm. If I go out and I do that again on Sunday, that's $10,000, $11,000 worth of stuff. If I do that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, great. It doesn't take me all day to find quality stuff. And none of that stuff was garbage. None of that stuff was junk. My average sale price is probably high 40s, low 50s. $3 buy cost. A lot of people are great sourcers. We hear that a lot. I'm a great sourcer. But then you look in the back and all their stuff is sourced, but none of it is listed. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. So if we are great sourcers, that's great. But how valuable is that to our business if we're not listing it? Here's the thing. Hold I on. think a lot. Slow okay. your roll. Go ahead. So for me, I'm not out spending all day finding stuff. Was I out all day finding stuff when my listing goal was hugely um, aggressive? Yes. But let, let's just count me as a regular person. I found 300 items in three hours. I would be done for the week. Right? Mm -hmm. 
the reason why me sitting my butt in the chair listing is the most valuable part of my business is why. Because of you can process those items and turn them into money. I'm the fastest lister on the planet. Mm -hmm. There's no one who could do it faster than me. There's no one who can get as good of keywords as me for my business. There's no one that, that can price the items as well as I can for my business. So for me, being the fastest lister on the planet, and I'm not bragging or boasting, we've had thousands of people through the group, undefeated. I, I have videos in the group, tutorials in the group, listing items in 23 seconds. And there's still room on the table for that. I left a little padding just in case anyone wants to have be a contender. Still a little padding. So if I am the fastest lister on the planet, and I can get items in three hours and I'm done for the whole week. Why is it not the most valuable part of my business to process these and make quality, perfect listings and me spend all my time doing that? I think the reason why it's so profitable is because of how good the items are. If the items were $10 items, it wouldn't be nearly as valuable. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be nearly as valuable, but it would being able to process and list them the fastest is mm -hmm. valuable. I agree with you. I agree. And, and that's why for me, if you were sitting in the chair, that's different. You are not as valuable sitting in this chair as I am sitting in this chair. Mm -hmm. Because agree. if I would hire you and pay you and I spend all my time outsourcing, maybe you do 80 a day. But if I sit in this chair, I could do 200 a day. And that's more valuable to the business. Um. I don't know. I feel like the business, the business is stronger with that sourcing skill, like because of how skilled you are at sourcing, plus how skilled you are. It's not like it's one or the other. It's it's like right. I just think that like but we're this talking skill. the most valuable part of the business. Mm -hmm. So even when the people were bringing me 250 items a day, mm -hmm. they're not more skilled than me at sourcing. I agree. But my skill of getting those items listed that's what made the business a powerhouse. Oh, that's what I was going to Here's the thing. Take, do you feel that people who have those piles of clothing behind them or whatever the item is of the stuff that's not listed, I feel like the reason why I don't list my items is is because they suck. Like, I don't want to list that stuff because it's garbage. You know what I mean? It's. It, I feel like I'd be better off going out and getting better stuff than listing that stuff that's $1, $5, $10, $10, whatever. It's all my Nautica sweaters or something. So why so, did you buy it in the stuff first place? Was, I, you see, now we're going back to sourcing again. That's what I'm saying. I think that it. Yeah, but just because you suck at sourcing doesn't mean doesn't mean that that's your your best opportunity. Your best opportunity in sourcing is if you're the best sourcer. It's not if you're yeah. a bad sourcer. Mm -hmm. If you're I agree. a bad sourcer, then then you're you're doing it backwards. I think a hundred percent. You need to become an excellent sourcer with a lot of. And I feel like the only reason how you got so good at sourcing is because of how many hours you put into it. You know, like if of you course. spent all your time, because there's people here, here's another, there's people who spent, who decided to spend all their time processing, right? That was their focus, photo and listing items. And they, they're not that good at sourcing. They're like, if I took them to a thrift store, like they wouldn't be able to show me the $20 profits and stuff like that. Cause they don't really know the brands. They don't know the items, but like having that skill that you have of sourcing, I think it unlocked everything else in the business. That's why I'm saying it's the most valuable. Like I, if you were not as good of a sourcer, if you were only sourcing, you know, small pony polo shirts or something like that, right? Like, could you make a beautiful business? Yes, because you, you'd have a consistent baseline. But I think because of your upside, because every time you, today, this morning, you saw two pairs of shoes inside of a bin or like, this is $400 right here. And you okay. immediately knew they were 400 bucks. But like, if that person who, who saw the bin themselves, they didn't see it. So that could have been $20 that they had in their pocket at that time that they could have turned into 800. And now how much, how many more opportunities do they get by having $800 in their pocket compared to if that person, you know, they got the items that they got, if they went home and listed, maybe they only get, you know, $200 today or $300 today, but you saw something that could have made them 800 bucks just by putting their money right there. So like, that's why, I, that's why I think that sourcing is, it's so, so valuable. Like, and if people can finish their work faster, like if you can, and here's the thing, I feel like if you can process your work faster, you get your 15 done, like as quickly as you can, you go out there and you find another 15, the best 15 you can, even if it means you go to nine stores and get two items per store, like you get the best two items. I think that is more valuable 
than going to one store and getting 15 items and the other 10 are down the list, not as good. Well, I never say pick up garbage. I never say I that. I agree with you. But I a lot of people that. pick up garbage. That That's their fault. That's not my fault. What, what <laughs> I'm saying here is that you can go out and find as many items as you want. Mm -hmm. If you never put your butt in the chair, you will never succeed in this business. Mm -hmm. So we have to put our butt in the chair and list the items. Now, does it have to be the best items? No, you can build a great business on being a great lister. You don't need the best items. You could build a great business on being a great lister. When I had 53,000 items, I didn't have the best items, but I was a great lister. No, you did, though. That's I not didn't fair. have the best items. I didn't have the best. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's Some the thing. of them You're... were the best, but not all of them. A lot of that stuff I would have passed. Your baseline, your baseline may not have been the best, but you have all of the 300, 400, 500, 700 dollar items in your store. Of and course. I think I think if you ran the same business and eliminated everything that was the hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars and up, all of those were gone from your business. I don't think your business would be as strong. You wouldn't be printing mm -hmm. money the same way. I think so, because my average sale price was twenty five bucks. It was four dollars into twenty five. Mm -hmm. And I feel like. I feel like it's harder to make that business work than it is to make when you when you have that extra business inside of your business where you're going, you know, five dollars into 50, five dollars into 100, five dollars into 500 with that business inside of your business. It made it way stronger, way stronger. And like and it, it's not even close. It's not even close. Like if you have a business where you don't have any of those higher dollar sales, like if your best sales are thirty dollars. I think that business is much more difficult to run, way, way more of a grind, way harder to like actually make money in this business doing that than it is if you have a business where you have those upsides too. I disagree. Dang it, dude. Why? I would take I would take all $30 items, all $30 sales, mm -hmm. then. But is the sell through there on those? That's why I would take it. Yeah, because the sell through isn't there on one hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars, two thousand dollar items. I agree. So like I just sold a, a Jordan jersey. Um, it's a baseball jersey. I sold it for six hundred dollars. It took me 16 months to sell it mm -hmm. where I, I can go to the thrift right now and find twenty five dollar items that are going to sell within 90 days. And I could have turned that money way faster, way more. That sounds like me. I tried that and it didn't work. No, 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 no. You tried twelve dollar items. Yeah. Free shipping. That, well, twelve twelve dollar items sell even faster than twenty five dollar items. So how come twelve dollar items don't opportunity cost? Let's go take. Let's yeah, do but it. that's not how true. Come... That's not true because you said forty fifty dollar items sell just as fast. So which one is it? Hold on, wait. We're not talking about that right now. So oh, we're not talking about that right now. <laughs> so the so twelve dollar items in theory will sell faster than a twenty five dollar item, right? In, in general, at least. So we're looking yeah, in general. In theory or by fact, which one is it, man? It's by fact. I think I think if you had items that are 15 bucks, come here. Uh, okay, Bro. we got to put a bunch. Of, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I got to put a bunch of caveats in here. I'm sorry. If you hold have on. garbage items for cheap, I would rather sell a good item for the right I price. I agree with you. That's, that's See, that's why I had to put the caveats in here. Because you see, there are $15 items that people price. There are items that are worth $6 that people price at 15 That's not what I'm talking about. Like, if you had an item that was worth $25, right? You price it at 15 versus pricing it at 25. Yep. I think that you would have the faster sell through rate with that item at 15 bucks. What is the item worth? Is it worth 25. 15 or is it worth that's 25? Different. That, that's, that's different. I know. That's, I know. That's, that's what I'm bringing. Different. That, I know. That's, that's, that's totally but you different. Don't, but you don't make more. It, there's like, I know how you, you say it. They're like, hey, I would eliminate all the top stuff and only have the $25 Tommy Bahamas, right? But. There's a limit to that. You're not willing to do that same thing for the $15 polo shirts. You're not willing to do that same thing for the $10 chap shirts. What if you got all the chap shirts for free? Free into $10 all day, every day. Why don't but you it, do that? But chaps into $10 all day, every day is not all day, every day. Yeah. Okay. But if it was literally free into... Into polo shirts. Polo small ponies. Okay. So so the sell through on those is going to be going to be long. And free into $10 plus shipping... You can build a great business on that, but how you're do not you building your business. But how do you build that business? Listing every day, all day, a hundred a day. Where? Right here, right? But in the chair, yeah. I agree. So so what part is the most valuable part of that business? Is it the small ponies or is it sitting in this chair? It's sitting in the chair. 
Okay. That's what I've been. But I think to. I think the businesses where you put where you're spending up. Okay. Here's the hard part because you have people out there who source a bunch of items but don't list any of the stuff. Like you That's know how why you're sitting saying, here is the most valuable part. But you know how you're so you're saying how um how you don't tell people to pick up garbage. Like it's understood. You, you might not say like out your mouth like, hey, don't pick up garbage, guys. But like you you expect us to not be picking up trash stuff. I expect people to list the stuff they source. Well, so dude, if that, that that's a different expectation. That is a different <laughs> expectation to to expect people to list their items. So so you are expecting people to find great items and then expect them also to list them. Yeah, okay. Okay, dude. That's so different. The businesses where um people are like where you are focused on sourcing as many quality, not as many quality, as the, the highest quality items you can. I think those businesses end up making more money than businesses that are focused only on processing. Because and here's the thing, you are both, which is why this is so hard, right? Like you have the best sourcing and the best listing. It's not like you suck at listing and your sourcing's good. You don't have like a bunch of inventory just sitting in the back or something. So like- All right, <sighs> so but how about this though? The people that are disciplined enough to source high quality items are probably also disciplined enough to list them. And that's what I'm saying. Those people make the most money in this business compared to other iterations of it where you're like, because for example, Nina and I worked just as hard, right? We worked just as hard. And like, we did the same number in sales last year. I focused on processing. She focused on sourcing. Nina made more money than me by a significant margin last year. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's because she focused on getting high quality items, even though her sell-through rate was lower than mine. She still made more money than me, significantly, despite our sale total being the exact same. I have to sell. So let's say if I did 50K, Nina would do 100K because I have to sell two items to match one of hers. So I think if you have that sourcing there, like if you're an excellent sourcer and you list your items, hopefully, and you're, you're sourcing high quality items, I think it is better than if you were to be an excellent processor, because we know a lot of excellent processors. And we like, don't you do like, really though. we don't really. Yeah, don't. I don't know. Uh, well, that's not what I mean. I mean, we in the sense really of like, if, okay, think about it this way the average listing goal is five items a day, right? I think when they, when people do the studies, people on average list five items a day or lower. Um, if there are people out there that list 40, 50, 60 items a day, but like their sales don't reflect 50, 60, 70 items a day, and they've had to pivot away from that. And focus on picking up higher quality items. Go like check out reseller YouTube right now, Ted. I'm telling you, like you're gonna see a, a plethora of people going. I gotta focus on picking up higher quality items because I think the sourcing skill wasn't built strong enough yet. You see, you started processing a bunch of stuff with excellent. You were processing. You were processing all your stuff. Here's here's the other thing, Ted. You your initial model was I went out, bought a bunch of stuff, listed everything that I found that day. That was that's how you that's how you started it. It wasn't I went to one store, got a hundred items, spent the week trying to list those a hundred items, and like it didn't really matter how good they were. You only focus on picking up quality stuff that would sell. And like that, that's I think that's the thing that's missing. Like, and so I do agree that sitting in a chair and listing is the highest profit generating task you can do. But I believe the sourcing skill is potentially the most valuable skill in the business. Because you could be a slow processor, but if you pick up quality stuff and get it listed, I think that business is better than the other business. You're wrong because you're going to outbuy what you can process. Don't do that. <laughs> no, you, you, you can't say that though. So if, if you're too slow at listing the items, you're going to end up underwater with a death pile. What's too slow? No, I just mean like you're slower Buying at listing. Buying more stuff than you list. Don't do that. I'm saying not to do that. Right, but... <laughs> That's why this is the most valuable part of doing it is listing the items. Because if you don't list them, that's the bottleneck. I agree. And since I can list them the fastest, back up the truck, open up the door and tilt it over and dump it in the yard. But you don't want Ralph Lauren small ponies for 15 that you can buy for, get for free sell for 15. You would I can build a beautiful business about that. I can build a beautiful business around that. I know. Because I have the processing speed to do so. Mm -hmm. Can you do it at 15 items a day? No, that sucks. Wait, so you're saying that, hold on. So you're saying that for me, maybe sourcing is the best, but for you, well, not for you necessarily, but okay. No, are, we, are we talking about you and I? 
No, processing is the most important part. Processing listing is the most important part. Yeah. Because we've had this conversation. I, we've also had this conversation. I'm just going to mention this in passing, and we're not going to we're, we're not going to talk further on it. Three years ago, when you guys first started the shoe call, I said Nina was going to come up and she was going to lap everybody. And that's exactly what happened. But we're, we're going to keep rolling on that one. All right. So if you were running the business of selling $12 shoes, right? Mm -hmm. And you did 10 a day, that business sucks, right? It's an awful business. If you did 1,000 a day, how's the business? It's, it, it's okay. If you did 10,000 a day, how's the business? That's an excellent business, probably. How about twenty five thousand a day? Could be. I mean, but here's the thing: take like to do twenty five thousand a day. How many people do you need? You know what I mean? Right. But as we process more, we could be forgiving on the items. So, like, if if people want to buy bad items, they better sit in the chair. Mm -hmm. They better sit in the chair and get those items listed, and we're gonna have a large store, which is fine. You could build a beautiful business off of that. We just have to understand what kind of business we're running. So is there a correlation? And this one's this one is for you. This one is for the, for the, for the comments. Is there a correlation between bad product selection and a bad listing habit and good product selection and a good listing habit? Is there a correlation between those two? Are the people that struggle listing do they pick up bad items or are there people that have King Tut's entire treasure in their house, but they can't get the items up? Now we're going to hear people that go, I have $500,000 worth of stuff in my storage unit. I'm a great, I'm a great source. We're going to hear those people. If you are a great sourcer, does that correlate with you being a great lister? If you if are were... a bad sourcer, does that correlate with you being a bad lister? They're not real. They're unfortunately, they're not, intrinsically related to each other unfortunately it just it just tends to, you said correlate though it's not causation so like does it correlate yeah i think a lot of the times when i don't know because there's people who have bad items but they list a bunch and they list every day yeah i don't know if they list every day but they list a bunch there's people out there but i think the reason why a lot of people don't want to tackle their death pile and we've heard it a thousand times like should I be listing this stuff in my death pile? It's like $5. It's like $7. And we like, just get the money out of it. Don't, don't just leave mm -hmm. it there. You know? Mm -hmm. So we tell them like, get your money out of that stuff, but how much they want to go out to the store. Cause they want to go pick up, you know, um, Pat Aloha, like you were talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, like that, that's what, the, if they found that they might list it today. And here's the other thing. We were talking about this last yesterday in the hundred K call. Um, someone was mentioning how when they were getting their pallets in, they would, basically get the good stuff out of the palette and leave everything else. So there might actually be a correlation there of like, we tend to list when we have good stuff, when we have garbage, we don't want to go through it. And then we go out and source, which makes sourcing a liability, not an asset. I agree. So there you go. So, so sourcing can be a liability. Listing can never be a liability. That's true. I agree. So, Unless your price gets too high or something, but yeah, I can see it. So for, for us, the person who ordered pallets of hard, of hard goods, mm -hmm. they choose the best stuff. They list it. They keep ordering. They keep ordering. They keep ordering. They keep cherry picking the best stuff listed, cherry pick the best stuff listed. And eventually we have a bunch of stuff that have we have deemed substandard or subpar. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is a liability for our business. Mm -hmm. Sourcing can be a liability for the business. Listing can never be a liability for the business. I think you got that one. I, th I think I think I think that was the nail right there. Like that that's that's a fair argument for like how the value is higher for listing than it would be for um sourcing. Even I still do believe though, if you're like listing five, 10, 15, 20, 30 a day, like you should spend a lot of time sourcing. Which is and I don't think you disagree with that. I don't think you're saying like you should not spend a lot of time sourcing. Um but it's I think that we should find a lot of time. Like, dude, if you're listing ten a day. I don't think you should be out there a lot of time. Would you go, would you go out there and get your, like, but here's the thing, the people, typically when people are listening to today, they don't have the same level of product knowledge as you do. You know right. I mean? But, but so, that's the point that we got to get to, cause that's the opportunity cost. So is, is yeah. do we have more return on time, more return on opportunity running around all day to find our 20 or can we find something else inside of our business that can give us more bang for the buck? So we were talking last night 
on the Tech Tuesday call, and I'll sit on there for hours and hours and hours and hours. However many questions you guys have, I'll answer them. And the first question out the gate was show us some good Nike stuff that sells for good money. I went 15, 20 minutes freestyle crazy Nike stuff. And I, you said that this morning. You did not go 15, 20 minutes. You went like 40 minutes. Like, I don't, like It was ridiculous. No matter how long it was, <laughs> later on in the call, people were asking, how do you learn this? How do you learn this? And while people are asking questions, while they're, they're getting to the question, while we're getting to the meat and potatoes of the discussion, I have eBay open and I'm endlessly scrolling it and accepting that information into the hard drive where now when people bring stuff up on the Wednesday Bolo call, the Wednesday show and tell call, not a lot of that stuff catches me by surprise. Some of the women's stuff, yeah, because that's not my strongest. But like, you know, people will show shoes, people will show clothes, people will show today some climbing gear. I'm there because we put in the time. So like we do have to put in the time if we want to make sure we're getting the most bang for the buck. And we have to we have to research like that is the that's probably the hardest part of doing this is because it's not fun. It's kind of like school. It sucks. Like you can't get better at it by like just doing the process more like you can get better at shipping by shipping more items like you're, you're not going to get better at the product knowledge without putting in the time and effort to do so. But like, that's one of the only things in the business that costs us nothing. It's free to just look at the solds and figure out what sells good. And if you want to have the best opportunity cost, the best return on your time, it's going to the flea market, cleaning it out in two or three hours. It's going to the thrift store. And I've showed it on my videos, cleaning them out in 30 or 45 minutes, walking out with $4,000 worth of profit. That is your best opportunity. If you want to get better at sourcing, your best return on time is going to be, again, sitting your butt in front of the computer, learning, having this stuff embedded in your head so that way you can go out and find it. Question. And then I'm going to talk, I want to, I want to also bring back up what you mentioned about the flea market a second ago too. So we talk a good bit about the eight into 30, right? A basic model for a $20 profit, roughly. Um, if someone is going to their store, they've been listening to the calls. They're like, okay, I'm getting an idea. I should be aiming for eight into 30. And that's a suggestion, by the way, everyone. Yeah, like, I take us and say that you have to do that. You can do whatever business model you want to do. Yeah, I was doing $12. That's just shoot. the guideline. Like, we have to start somewhere. And a lot of people, they come on and they say, hey, what is your goal? And they say, I want to make $100,000 profit. Again, the least resistance way to make $100,000 would be 14 $20 items profit. That's the least resistance way. Because $20 profit, those items are out there. You don't have to search high and low. They are there. If you do 14 of those a day, that is the least resistance way to 100000 That's what I always say. Now, is, you know, 10 $30 items? That's still going to get you to the same point. But $30 profit items are harder to find. So we're going to spend more time sourcing. Is 28 $10 items still going to get you there? It's still going to get you there. But now we have to spend more time processing. So the least resistance way between processing and spending time sourcing is 14 $20 profit items. That's the least resistance. That's just a guideline. That's not a requirement. That's not a suggestion. That's not a must do. That's just the guideline. So any if you go this far on this side, it's going to be more processing. $15 items, it's more processing. If you go farther on this side, it's just going to be more sourcing, more time spent sourcing. So it's just an example of starting point of the least resistance way to get a hundred thousand dollars profit is 14 20 dollar items so you're so when it comes to getting that twenty dollar profit um I was about to say i lost my train i thought i had that i, 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 I was about to hit you with up with a head oh i got it now. so someone is someone they want to get their 14 right they go out they hit a store they only found two right so they hop into the group you know hop into a call they say tech I'm not able to find, you know, enough of these $20 profit items in my store. I only found two. So instead I picked up, you know, 12 more items that were $8 profit or $11 profit, whatever it is. Right. Would what would you advise that person in order to increase the amount of higher profit items that they find? What would you tell them to do? There's not two items at the thrift store with a $20 profit. Yeah. There's way more than that. We just we just can't see them yet. 
So when Brett, he runs the men's clothing call and he does the deep dive document, which has probably three or 400 brands in it by now, all the nuance, all the brands, the sell through, everything to look for. It's probably our, our most valuable resource in the group. We went out to lunch. He lives down the street. I met him for the first time a couple of weeks ago. And after lunch, he hit me. I didn't know. He goes, you want to hit a couple of thrift stores? And at first I said, I don't know, man, not, not really. And he goes, come on, let's do it. So I said, all right, let's do it. So we went to a thrift store um, and then we went to another one. We went to two thrift stores and him and I together were able to do pull out over four thousand dollars worth of profit in two thrift stores. We went at 2 p.m. in the afternoon on a Wednesday, unscheduled, weren't the first ones there. There were a bunch of other resellers there and the items that we were able to find were still there. But they were just items that people didn't know about, like Frey. I picked up two for a button-up shirts. One was brand new, which was a bonus. Those sell for about 175, 200. Pre-owned sell for 100 and up. And my average buy cost was five dollars and sixty cents. My average sale price was forty dollars. And again, were there two twenty-dollar items there? Absolutely, there was. Was there another forty items there? Absolutely, there was. But everyone else was blind to those items. So unless we know about these items, of course, we're always going to go to thrift stores and find two items. So what would I advise? Do the zip code call, constantly scroll the solds, constantly make an effort to embed this stuff in our brain like a steel trap so we'll never forget it. So that way, when we do see it, we can pick it up and we don't leave it for somebody else. Because one of the worst things that we can do as resellers is pass on profitable inventory. So just like the video that we watched today, those two pairs of shoes, those were the two best shoes in there. And we went for the Jordan Highs, which was the least valuable pair in there because the Jordan High are familiar, Jordan 1s. The other two, we got to know that too. So we got to get to the point where we know that stuff too. And I only know that because I've researched that before. I've looked at that before. People have brought those into my store. I have sold those before. So we have to gain the research. We have to gain the knowledge because I promise you, and this is one of the things that I'm going to do. I'm going to travel throughout the entire country. Get, let me get some ducks in a row. Let me close down the warehouse in August. And on all of my flea markets that I go to, they're not in major metropolitan areas. Sometimes I go to a flea market with a town of 1,500 people. And I found $14,000 worth of stuff in a flea market with 1,500 people. I, I have no advantage. There's other people there. But the knowledge helped me not walk out of there with two items. So there is no doubt in my mind that there is no shortage of inventory. It's out there. I will go around all the states, and I'm going to give it my best shot. Am I going to dominate every single state, every single city? No. But I'm going to give it my best shot. And I hope to show that there is stuff out there. And by acquiring the knowledge that is going to be our best asset for the business. So the best asset of the business, first and foremost, is right here. I was, I, much stuff. One, I was thinking the same thing. At, hearing you talk about research and knowledge and like experience and things of that nature, it made me go, huh, maybe even higher than sourcing and listing. It could be that. Now, there are people out there who have a lot of knowledge, but without execution, it doesn't really matter. Right. So you got to do too, of course. But if you have the knowledge, it changes all of your dues to a, to a sure. substantial level. But, so there's two ahead. things. We have to have the knowledge of, of the product. And like you said, the knowledge of the execution, both of those. So now, once I had the knowledge of the product, I figured out ways to get it all the way to the point where I have people bringing me a few thousand pieces a day. And then I tapped into the knowledge of the execution, which was now let's move this into a wholesale model and, and sell $25,000, $30,000 every single day of wholesale. So you have to have both. Both of those are very, very valuable. But until we get to that level where, where the knowledge is our most valuable asset, the execution is our most valuable asset. Until we get to that level, we are one item, two items, 10 items, 20 items, and we will grow to this level where different parts of our business now give us better opportunities. So when we talked to Caleb Phoenix Resale last week on the podcast, he started the same exact way, garage sale. One garage sale, drive 10 minutes, go to the other garage sale, go to the other garage sale, five minutes late, find nothing. That was a good opportunity. 
until he found out about flea markets, which you drive to one place and there's 200 garage sales in a row. That's a better opportunity. Then he figured out, let me go to conventions because at, at a flea market, there's sure there's 200 garage sales, but 15 of those might have games. Mm -hmm. Now my best opportunity is let me go to conventions. Everyone at a video game convention has video games. Everyone at a video game collection is looking to sell video games. Now that became his best opportunity. Then he started, you know, buying out collections. Then he started, you know, doing wholesale deals. And now he's developed an app where you can scan a video game and now you can send it right to him. So mm -hmm. the opportunity cost changes as our business evolves. And eventually everybody kind of moves into the model where wholesale becomes the best option. So like for him, he's buying in bulk and he's wholesaling it out to Amazon using them as the vehicle. Essentially, he just wholesales to Amazon. That's what he does. Amazon processes it. They have it listed. They do all of that stuff. And when we went down to Miami and we went to the number one shoe seller, their business is wholesale. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of items come in, hundreds of items go out. So but once upon a time, their business was buying one shoe, one box, one truck, one pallet. Now it's selling whole truckloads to different countries all the way around the world. So I think as we evolve, as our knowledge gets better, as more opportunities come, as we break out of this mindset of, of scarcity, because I think that holds a lot of us back. Once we figure out that there are items out there, there is abundance out there we begin to see the opportunity. We can never see the opportunity when we're looking this close and it's a scarcity mindset. Once we figure out that, th this is this is very important. Th this has helped me a lot. The items are already made. We don't have to make the items. They've already been made. They're, they're out there already. Right now, they're out at, at the rack. Right now, they're out at a, at a flea market. Right now, they're out at a garage sale. I don't have to make them. They've already been made. That's part one. I just have to get a couple of them. And the money is already printed. I don't have to make the money. I don't have to print the money. I just need to find a little bit of it. Once I started thinking like that, of that this stuff has already been made and the money, the money has already been printed, I just have to go out and find a way to bring a little bit back home with me. And once you start thinking like that, then you start thinking about different opportunities and different ways how to reach those different opportunities. Dude. Dude. So there was a point of what you said where you were reading my mind basically, because I was about to ask you a follow-up question to when you said um about the people that oh, can only find two items in their store that can hit the $20 profit. Mm -hmm. I was gonna when you mentioned how you and Brett were able to find all that stuff, I was like, okay, you guys live in Florida though. I live okay. in small town Mississippi. Like I I you can't find that stuff in small town Mississippi, you know? Sure. Now I'm not saying that as an individual, but someone who is only finding two who can't find those twenty dollar profits. That's not be what they. I live in a rural town, Tech. There's That's only right. twenty people in a in a stop sign in my town. That's you know right. what I mean? So like, I can't I can't find the stuff. How am I supposed to make this work when I can't find this stuff? I got the knowledge, Tech. It's just not here. So the largest seller that I know <laughs> lives in a town that doesn't even have a stop sign. <laughs> And they sell tens of millions of dollars a year. And this is 2024. It doesn't have to be in our backyard. We don't even have to go to garage sales. They buy stuff online, bring it into their town that has not even one stop sign. And they sell tens of millions of dollars a year. So number one, it's 2024. Number two, sometimes you have to go to where the stuff is. Because Isaiah... They've already made the hokas, right? Mm -hmm. How do you go out and go find some? You can go out to your mailbox for the hokas, and there is a chance you will find one. There might be a 0.001% chance, but there is a chance. Mm -hmm. Or you can hit the road, and it sucks, but you might have to drive an hour. You might have to drive two hours. Some of these flea markets, I'm driving six hours. It's already been made. It's already been printed. We have to go out, and we have to go get it. And that's what I'm saying. And that's why I'm so I, I feel so differently about sourcing these days than I used to, because you're dude, you're retired. 
essentially, right? When it comes to eBay and you're still going out three, four, five hours, like you don't have to go out and get anything. You could just have everybody bring you your stuff and that's the only stuff you send out. But you're still going out, get going three hours, four hours, five hours to go get inventory. And like, you don't have to. No, I so don't like, have to. I just do that for educational purposes. But, but think about us, Dave. Yeah. But think about us, yeah. though. Us yeah. here, like a lot of us, we want to pay our bills doing this. We want sure. to get to the next level. We want to set up our families, you know, uh, like bring our, our spouses home and stuff like that, you know. So we can't do that. Like, how come you can do it and you're good? And like, we can't go take a three hour drive to do Because here's the thing, bro. In Louisiana, like right beside me, three hours away. And something that you've been out, talking about. Yep. Yeah, they, it turns out they have the same shoe policy that we used to have here in Mississippi, where the shoes are $4 for any shoe. Any shoe that's there is $4 and then $6 for boots. Mm -hmm. I could take a three hour drive to Louisiana with some money in my pocket, scoop around in a bunch of places. And like, you think oh, I won't find a hotel? Why not? Why not? Like, I, but I, like, I could go to Tennessee, same thing. I could go to Ocean Springs, same thing. I can go to Alabama, same thing. So it's like, Tech is going six hours, seven hours to get this stuff. It's not like Tech is only going to his flea market right outside his house Dude, to get his stuff. If I went to my flea market right outside my house, I would get more stuff. Yeah. But I have the advantage there. That's why I don't go there. Yeah. It's shooting fish in a barrel over there. That's why I go six hours away where nobody knows me, smaller town, and still find a way to get it done. So yes. there's a couple lessons in that. Sometimes you got to hit the road. Unfortunately, if you don't, great for you. Sometimes you got to hit the road. Sorry. No advantage is needed. But the only thing that separates it is waking up and going out there and right here. Because you can have all this. And if you don't wake up and go out there, it means nothing. Mm -hmm. So you got to wake up and go out there. And you got to have this. That's the only thing. That is the only separator between everything with being successful or not being successful because we could keep getting our ten dollar items you know that that we have to mark down massively to get them moved maybe we got to put them on 99 cent auctions to make it happen or you know is it more worth it for us to go three hours away and get items that maybe we pay six dollars for but we sell for 40 we sell for 50 that's right like which one which one's stronger which one's better so this is my last thing because i know we've been almost at two hours now bro oh, this is like, good. We hey, set the record and and I was talking to Phoenix Resale and, and we were looking at my YouTube channel and mm -hmm. all of my videos that are the longest have the most views. <laughs> and I said, hey, I've been trying to keep him at an hour. And he said, Joe Rogan is four hours and he gets the most views. So mm -hmm. he said, if, if someone sticks with you for an hour, maybe they'll stick with you for two. So I let this one run a little bit long, but I know you got to get to work, but I let this one run a little bit long. And this is why I want to know in the comments, will you guys watch? longer form podcast hour and a half maybe even two hours so long as the conversation is good is that something you guys are interested in or you want me to keep it short and sweet one hour because i know the podcast we probably listen to it in the background and that's what i want it for i don't want anyone watching us like tv listen mm -hmm. in the background do your work you could work with us will you guys watch longer form should i have kept phoenix resale on for two hours let, let me know your thoughts in the comments, but let's touch on the last thing and then let's dude, get Isaiah to work. Dude, before we leave with that, dude, the thing that he said about the table leg, bro, Mariah and I just threw our hands in the air like that's ridiculous. So he was talking about how people come into the room and there there's a table in there with one leg on it and they yeah. can buy legs from the corner. They got $20 and people put two or three legs on there so they can balance the balance the ball rather than taking one leg away. And I was yeah. like, that is what I've been doing in my business this whole time. <laughs> I have been like, I'm like, okay, I want to make more money, right? I lost my supplier, this, that, or the other. I need to get more inventory. So I'm like, let me just add a bunch of legs on here so that I can be able to pull this off rather than mm -hmm. going, what are things that I can remove to make it a lot, to make my business easier and make me, so we can make more money. And I'm, dude, that right there was chef's kisses, but here we go. All right. Um, you go to the flea market every weekend, basically. And you are going out. You might even go to multiple flea markets in a day. So you I go really out, you, you, you clear out that whole flea market. You buy everything that anyone has um, that, is, that hits your metrics, right? Now, then you might even go to a second flea market. Because, but you're able to, you have enough cash flow. Your budget's high enough where you can do that. So 
how my opportunity cost question was how do you actually govern who gets your money and why if you didn't have that same budget because like if you only have two hundred dollars or four hundred dollars that you can spend at the flea market maybe you can only go to five out of the ten vendors or two out of the ten vendors depending on what kind of stuff they have so yeah. when you have a more limited budget and you're trying to go to the flea market what should someone's strategy be as they're walking over the bridge um what should they do first and then how do you determine who to spend your money on? Because the downside is if I spend my money with this person this week and I come back next week, they're going to be looking for me to spend money with them again. But if I only have $200 and the person down there has like seven on clouds for $15 each or whatever, I might spend all my money buying their on clouds and not have any money for my primary person. So how do you go about governing who gets the money? And it, it kind of feels like it's hard to build relationships really when your budget is limited like that. All right. Let's see if you can stick the landing. How are all of our decisions guided? What is our North star? Bank account resistance. That's right. Least what resistance. is going to fill our bank account with the least resistance? Mm -hmm. That's how you determine who to buy from. So what about the relationships though? What relationship is going to fill my bank account with the least resistance? But but like this guy has stuff for me last week and the week before that. But this person over here has all hocus. And like, this is where I, the money's at. The money's on this person. I'm not his daddy. <laughs> I, I am not obligated to buy from him for eternity. Who is going to bring me the best stuff for the best price? Dang, dude. Bro, when I went to the flea market, I had, there was this lady who I used to go see all the time. She was killing it, bro. Like I, I would get the best prices, best deals from her. And when I went back last weekend, the people who made me leave the flea market because they were killing me on, on the price, mm -hmm. those were the people who had the best prices, best stuff in them. And mm -hmm. I was like, I went over there and, and did made a killing. I went over to the OG lady though, because I wanted to spend a little bit of money with her for the relationship. And her prices were too high. She was like $40 for Air Force Ones and stuff. You know what I mean? And I... If if I didn't have a little bit more money, like let's say I spent all my money on those people, then I wouldn't have even been able to go see her at all because I got all of the good stuff from those people. So like it makes me feel bad. And I know I shouldn't feel bad or whatever, but it makes me feel bad that I can't, you know, take care of that relationship. You know what I mean? Because she's done so much good for me. Like I feel almost obligated to go spend money with her right. compared so to- You're being emotional. Yeah. You're being emotional, yeah. which is fine. You want to know- how to bring people's price down at the flea market. I know exactly how to do it. Don't buy it. We, we will leave them with this one. You want to know when someone has their price sky high and other people's don't, how, how you get that person to bring their price down? You go to the flea market and you go to that table that has everything for the cheap and you fill up your basket and you take the long way out and you walk past them and you give them a wave. And you do that for a couple of weeks, a couple of months. And eventually they're going to say, I would like to fill your basket too. How can I fill your basket, Isaiah? And then you have to have a conversation with them and say, Paul over there gives me these for eight bucks. You're charging 40. I would love for you to fill my basket too. There's only so long you let somebody walk past your table with a basket full and a smile on their face and then come back to the flea market with an empty basket, which means you still have money before they say, let's have a conversation. So when your basket is full, you walk past the vendors who you were not able to make a deal with and you show them my basket is full and you show I'm coming back for more. Because when people are hungry, day one, when people are hungry and there's a locked door, um, can I have some food, please? No, thank you. Close the door. Day two. Can I have some food, please? No, thank you. Day three. I want some food. No, thank you. Day four, they're going to beat down the door. Mm -hmm. So day one, you walk past them. It's okay. Day two, you walk past them. It's okay. You walk past them three, four, five <laughs> times with a cart full of stuff and you coming out to get more, they're going to start getting hungry. And then their price will change and then there'll be more likely to do business with you so maybe take the long way out maybe even zigzag a couple times i've done that too hey this guy was over here let me zigzag this way let me zigzag this way wave how you doing how's your day going how's sales 
and then head to the car and head right back. Dude, dude, that's beautiful. That's and she was watching me as I was cleaning up at those other that's places. Right. Too. How <laughs> many times is she gonna watch you? That makes sense. Before she went in on the action, because there's gonna be times where she goes home and she don't make no money, mm-hmm. but she know you was there with a pocket full of money, emptied someone out, and then came back to the flea market with more money in your pocket, and she didn't get none of it. That's interesting. I think the way how I've been thinking about the relationships is. I need to give them my money for the for their inventory so I can have inventory. Like mm-hmm. I need to give them my money so that like for the relationship for the inventory so I can get it next week. But mm-hmm. really what's actually happening is they need my money. They have to like, court you. You you are the hottest guy at the flea market. You don't know that yet though. Dude. I so I shouldn't think of man, I didn't go see Miss Miss Barbara today. Like Oh man, like she's gonna hate me next week. Instead, I should be like, Miss Barbara didn't have anything I wanted. Miss like, Barbara was was lacking today. Dude, yeah. When I go to the flea market, it's like going to the club. I am the hottest guy at the club when I go to the flea market. They're not the hottest ones. I'm not courting them. They're courting me. So if you have the if you have the money, like if we're the ones that are buying the stuff, you have the power. We have the power. We just act like we don't because we really want the item. But that doesn't matter. We have the power here. We need to go like, hey, I need to use my dollars to get the best quality inventory possible. And if I do that, I'll be able to set up my family, set up my kid, build my business. Right. And they should be able to do the same, too. So I was talking about this last night. My best guy who brings me the best stuff and the most amount of stuff. I met him at the flea market. When I met him... I bought three Vineyard Vines hats. I came back next week. He saw me. He goes, hey, my friend, I have three more hats that you bought last week. I bought three more. I saw him the next week. Hey, I have five Vineyard Vines hats. I bought five. Hey, I saw him next week. He had eight. And then the next week after that, he had five Vineyard Vines and five Polo hats. Hey, these are not Vineyard Vines, but they're the same. Just different logo. I'll take both. Me and him have come from three items a week. And we have grown together to now he brings me $5,000 worth of inventory per week. He has a new house, two new cars. His kid goes to private school. So you can grow together with your suppliers. He grew from three hats to $250,000 a year growing together. Now, who has the power in that relationship? You, because he's he's getting, well, you got, yeah. Me. I got the money. Mm-hmm. I got the money and I have the resources to buy as many items as he can bring. I had we, just as much power then as I did when I bought three hats. And we don't, and we're not saying power in like a negative way where you're no. like, you're trying to take advantage of people no. or make negotiations, people leverage, that kind of thing. That's the power that we're talking about. Who has the leverage? When you go to the flea market, who has the leverage? You have the leverage because you have the money. But I did. I wasn't thinking that way. I was thinking they have the leverage because they have the items. But like they, they want me to buy their stuff. Right. If they go home with all the items, they are not happy. Right. And and sure, there there's more people with more money, and there's more there's more people with more items. So if if, if they're asking too much, there's more people with more items. Maybe not at that flea market. Maybe you got to go to a thrift store so we can get more items. They they are not the last person on earth with the items. So we are not the last person on earth with the money. But we are we are the one at the flea market that is going to buy hundreds of items every single week. We're not coming over here buying one. We're not coming over here buying two. We're, we're not coming once a month. We're not coming once a quarter. Every single week I'm coming over here. I have a pocket full of money and I want to do business with you. If I don't show up this week, that's a bad week for you. Mm-hmm. I know that. Where if you don't show up, I'm still good. Because you I'm can good. go to the thrift store. You can go to all these other places. Another you can vendor. Go, yeah, I'm you can good. go to another vendor. Mm-hmm. I'm good. If, if if the guy who I bought all the Lululemon from, if he doesn't show up next week, I'm good. I'm good. I'm still going to get thousands of dollars worth of stuff. In worst case scenario, you keep your money in your bank account. That's it. And you, and <laughs> you live to fight another week. Yeah. Worst case scenario, you just keep it in your bank account. Dude, I love that.
Because I think the, the the listing goal was making me just kind of kind of go crazy. I'm like, oh, man, I got to get inventory so I can hit my listing goal so I can whatever, whatever, whatever. But when it really comes down to it, I just need to. I don't know. I don't know. Well, the, the listing goal is one thing The the assumed part in that is you're getting good stuff. Exactly. Not getting bad stuff just to hit the listing goal. That is never been the advice the advice is been, or less profitable stuff to hit the like, listing goal. it's always been stuff that meet the metric 10 of those per day meet yeah. the metric 20 of those per day meet the metric 30 of those per day it's not just list 10 that's never going to sell i'd rather you not even list if, mm -hmm. if you're going to list 10 items that are never going to sell don't even list do some research do some studying so my man i've kept you for long enough this was a great conversation give us a couple takeaways from today Dude, I, I have a ton of takeaways. One that I think sourcing is better than listening. <laughs> we will let the comments decide what is more valuable. I'll 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 leave with this. You can list, you can source as much, as much as you want. No one has, not a lot of people have a sourcing bottleneck. A lot of people have a listing bottleneck. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I All think right, I think if you if you had if you were a hundred percent in listing, fifteen percent in sourcing you would be worse than 100%. No, never mind. That's not true either. Never mind. Whatever. <laughs> I, I, never mind. <laughs> Maybe someone in the comments can 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 put it together more eloquently. And, yeah, and somebody allocate what I'm talking about. I believe in y'all. So, um, but yeah, big things for me was least resistance was really big. Um, I was aware of 100K opportunities is what I should be looking for because of where the business is, but it needs to be 100K least resistance. So sure. when I run into this next shiny object that pops up in my in the mix, I need to think, hey, is this 100K with least with less resistance than just adding an additional 100K onto my business mm -hmm. um, that I'm already running and just mm -hmm. you know doing more of what I already do? And then number two is like the leverage is in my hands. Yeah. Like I don't have to buy from these people. I can just keep my money. So if I only have $200 this week that I can spend, I go through the, all the vendors. I see who has the best 200 and I go here, my $200 goes to you because you have the best stuff. And mm -hmm. then everybody else is there. It's their job to figure out like, Hey, how can I get better stuff? So that when he walks through here, he goes, Whoa, you got that. Let me get, let me give you, let me give you 50 of this 200 real quick. And okay. then next week, if I if I list the stuff that I sourced, there you go. If I list, if I list the stuff that you source, um, then you 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 have three hundred dollars next time or two fifty, right. yeah. and then it gets better and better and better. You just grow with your supplier. So I love that, bro. This is a great conversation. I think so too. I appreciate you hanging out with me this week. I always love talking to you. You always ask challenging questions, and you make me better at what I do with, with trying to help as many people as possible because. You'll ask a couple questions. You'll ask them a couple different ways. The answer is always the same, but I do appreciate the different approaches and, and kind of the, the different ways to, you know, kind of push, push and, and, and provide a, a better answer, a clearer answer, um, a more thought out answer. So I do appreciate that. I appreciate everything that you do for me. Where can they find you? What do you got? Uh, um, Isaiah underscore TMN on everything at this point, Instagram and YouTube. Mm -hmm. But uh, guys, takeaways, here they are. Don't be afraid to drive. Really okay. important. Don't be afraid to drive. Number two, like download your knowledge first. You need to have that, that knowledge downloaded. The more that you learn, the higher your knowledge base is. Because that was our highest one, actually. We put yeah. knowledge above everything else. If yeah. you have that knowledge and you, bless you, honey. If you have that knowledge and you execute, that's going to be a lot better than if you're just trying to execute without knowledge at all. And then uh, number three, source what you list, please. Please, please. I mean, sorry, list what you source. Sorry. Like if you guys are out there sourcing stuff, like please list it so that my side can be, you know, a little bit more accurate. But if people are out here sourcing stuff and not listing it, then that's that's worse than $10 uh, small ponies. So that's all I got. So if all of our decisions are run through the filter of what's going to fill my bank account with the least amount of resistance, it's much easier to guide this ship of the business that we do have. Every decision, that everything that comes in, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of do this, do that, do this, do that. Great. We need to run it through the filter of, will this put more money in my bank account with least resistance? And if the answer is yes, then that's the direction that we should head. So... 
Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you for hanging in with me this long. If you guys like the longer format, post it below. Thank you for everybody for tuning in. Thank you for everyone that listens. I appreciate it so much. And as always, my man, be great. Be great.